Hello and welcome to Spectrum TV News, a recap of major stories within the week. I am Francis Adet, coming to you live from Iyo, the capital city of Akwaibom State. We'll take a look at the headlines. President Buhari said to flag off third oil field in northern Nigeria. Federal government unveils federal public service entrepreneurship program. Plus, former U.S. President Donald Trump indicted on criminal charges, a first for a former U.S. President. We'll bring you details of these stories and more in a moment. Many thanks for staying with us. Starting a uh, recap news is a report. A president Mohamed Bari set to flag on the third oil field in northern Nigeria. This is concerned in a public announcement by the Nigerian National Petroleum Corporation Limited, NNPCL, and the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority. The oil field is located in Ebenyi at the headquarters of the big local government area of Nasserwa State. According to reports, it is the second oil field in the north central region. The first was the Ibaji oil field in Kogi State. In the history of Nigeria's exploration, the Ebenyi oil field is the third in northern Nigeria. The first was Kolomani, located in the Bachi Gumbe Axis. And while President Mohamed Buhari within the week said Nigeria would experience effective governance under the administration of the president-elect Bala Ahmed Tinubu, he noted that Tinubu had the political pedigree and experience to achieve these by May 29 when he would take over the leadership of the country. The president said these in a statement issued by Special Advisor in Media and Publicity, Fermi Adeshina. According to him, his political pedigree from the 90s, active role in party politics, being elected senator and later governor of Lagos State, and diligent involvement in structure of leadership at the executive and legislative levels for many years, will serve as asset for good and effective governance. Away from that, Minister of Youth and Sports Development, Sandra Dara, says, the federal government will invest 14 billion naira to improve the welfare of youth core members and NYC staff. Dara said these in Abuja at the opening ceremony of the 2023 National Youth Service Corps NYC Annual Management Conference. According to him, the document, which contains other reforms proposal, has been submitted to President Mohamed Bari and is awaiting his assent. In the meantime, the federal government is to build three integrated villages to resettle 20,000 Nigerians refugees from neighboring countries of Chad, Cameroon, and Niger Republic. Governor Babagana Zulum of Boronu State made the disclosure while chairing a technical committee meeting in Abuja. Zulum, who is also the vice chairman presidential committee on repatriation, Returned and resettlement of refugees and management of repentant Boko Haram members said that at least 20,000 persons took refuge in neighboring countries. He said that President Buari had approved the release of 15 billion naira to the committee with the Boronu government handling the construction of the villages. The end, the governor said, was towards the resettlement of the returnees from the neighboring countries. So within the course of the week, the federal government launched the Federal Public Service Entrepreneurship Program, FPSEP, to prepare workers 
for life after retirement in Abuja. The head of civil service of the Federation, Dr. Fala Shale Isang, said DREAM was for the emergence of a skillful and more productive workforce that would contribute meaningfully to the development of the country as employees as well as employers of labor within the provisions of extant rules. Esang, who was represented by the Permanent Secretary of the Service Welfare Office, Ngozi Ongundiwe, tax civil servants to plunge the knowledge garnered from their training at FPSEP into agriculture and other business ventures that would enable them to create multiple sources of income for self-sustenance while in service and after exiting the service. According to her, the Public Service Entrepreneurship Program was developed out of the need to pay greater attention to the welfare of the public servants who constituted the administrative machinery for implementing government policies and programs. In the meantime, the presidency in the course of the week confirmed the resignation of the Minister of State, Petilum Resources, Demipria Silva, ahead of the All Progressive Congress APC governorship primaries in Bielsa State next month. President Mohamed Bari's Special Assistant on Digital Communications, Bashir Ahmed, in a tweet, in his official Twitter handle, confirmed the development after weeks of speculations about the intention of the minister. Silva had last year resigned as minister after declaring his intention to contest the presidential primaries of the APC. Moving now to legislature, where Senate has extended the implementation of the capital component of the 2022 budget from March 31st to June 30th, 2023. The extension followed the request by President Mohamed Bari for the Senate to amend the time for implementation of the capital components of the 2022 Appropriation Act moved at plenary by the Senate leader, Senator Ibrahim Goubier, APC Secretary East. The upper chamber suspended relevant standing rules to enable it to read the bill for the first, second, and third time. Gobier explained that the extension will enable the government to implement key projects in the capital component of the 2022 budget and allow for the completion of ongoing projects critical to current administration. Meanwhile, House of Representatives will on April 11, 2023, grill ministers and other heads of ministries, departments and agencies of the federal government, as well as oil companies and banks over the alleged illegal sale of 48 million barrels of crude oil valued at $2.4 billion. The committee, in a notice to the invitees, also demanded memoranda from whistleblowers whose alarm had led to the recovery of public funds from corrupt individuals and organizations. The committee invited 100 individuals, organizations and groups, including the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited, Group Chief Executive Officer, NNPCL, Federal Ministry of Finance, Budget and National Planning, Attorney General of the Federation, Director of Public Prosecutions of the Federation, Central Bank of Nigeria, Nigerian Upstream Petroleum Regulatory Commission, Chief Executive NUPRC, former Chairman, Presidential Committee and Recovery of Missing Crude Oil, former Director General DSS Lawal Musa Daura, Department of State Services, Nigerian Police Force, Interpol, National Central Bureau, Nigeria, among others. Meanwhile, the Chairman of the Committee, Mark Bila, disclosed that the panel had not been officially inaugurated as Speaker of the House, Femi Ngojabiamila, was unavoidably absent to declare the hearing open, adding that the inauguration of the committee will hold on April 11. In another development, Nigeria Governor's Forum, NGF, has condemned in strong terms the alleged plot to install an interim government other than the recently elected executives waiting to be sworn in on May 29th this year. A statement signed by the chairman of the forum, Governor Aminu Tambuel, notes that 
the governors will do all they can to defend the country's democracy as the firm will not support any unconstitutional regime change. The governors also condemn the continued delay in refunding the backlog of monies from stamp duties to states as it promises to explore every available means of getting the reforms to states, including going to court. According to reports, other issues discussed by the forum included a planned induction of the newly elected governors and their spouses scheduled to hold between May 14th through 19th this year. Away from that, the leadership of the Nigeria Labour Congress, NLC, and Trade Union Congress, TUC, have extended a strike ultimatum in it earlier issued the federal government for two more weeks, following consultations with the affiliate unions over the cash crunch policy. The decision was announced on Wednesday after a meeting with the National Executive Council members. Recall that the NLC had issued an ultimatum to go on strike beginning from Wednesday this week, nationwide, part of which was a plan to picket the various branches of the Central Bank of Nigeria. It is, however, not clear whether a meeting summoned by the Minister of Labor and Employment, Chris Ngiga, between the leadership of the NLC and CBN prompted a decision to extend the ultimatum for an additional two weeks. And elsewhere, the National Population Commission has said it had put up measures to guard against all forms of malpractices ahead of the forthcoming population and housing census. The commission also stressed that citizens living away from their states of origin do not need to travel to home for the purpose of the exercise. It said people would be enumerated at their places of residence. A spokesperson for the commission, Ishaka Yahaya, said this in an interview with Newsmen. Yahaya added that the commission had not finished the recruitment process for enumerators. In politics, the National Working Committee of the People's Democratic Party has appointed Umara Damangum to oversee the affairs of the party in acting capacity. National Public City Secretary of the PDP, Debo Ologunawa, announced this at a press conference at the party secretariat within the week. Damangun will replace Iocha Ayu as the national chairman of the party. On electoral matters, the Niger police force has said it recorded a total of 489 major electoral infractions during the February 25 presidential and March 18 governorship polls. Inspector General of Police Osman Baba made the disclosure during a meeting with senior police officers at the Goodluck Jonathan Peacekeeping Center Force Headquarters, Abuja. At the meeting where Deputy Inspectors General of Police, Assistant Inspectors General of Police, Commissioners of Police and all the members of the force management team, while noting that the culprits will be prosecuted, Baba said the police force will effectively collaborate with the leadership of the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, in ensuring that all the electoral offenders are expeditiously and transparently prosecuted, not only in the interest of criminal justice delivery, but in furtherance of their vision to sanitize the nation's democratic space. Background or influence should place his or her personal interests above national interests. Accordingly, while admonishing all political actors and their followers to submit to democratic norms, peaceful means and legal procedure in advancing their interests or seeking redress for their political concerns. I must firmly warn that the Nigeria police and other security agencies shall not tolerate the resort to incitement or any act designed to threaten our national security. They are therefore advised in the strongest possible terms, to henceforth draw back on current attempts to engender tension within the national security space to avoid attracting appropriate law enforcement response. In regard to this, feedbacks so far received across the 36 states of the Federation and the FCT 
indicates that a total of 489 major electoral infractions leading to the arrest of a total of 781 offenders were recorded nationally. Major General Bashar Magashi retired on Friday inaugurated multiple projects at the Nigerian Defense Academy NDA, Kaduna, in a bid to enhance the training of cadets. The projects inaugurated included roads in honor of war heroes in the NDA, NAF Base Link Road, and New Gate named after Magashi. The Defense Minister inspected concrete fence and bluff fence projects and also unveiled an adventure obstacle course where demonstration was carried out by the cadets. Speaking to newsmen after the inauguration, Magashi said he has had consistent expectations that the armed forces of Nigeria are doing their best in carrying out their constitutional duties to the nation. He noted that his visit to the NDA alongside inaugurating multiple projects was also to see areas of improvement in the training and other aspects of soldiering in the NDA to ensure a good breed of young officers. Similarly, the Minister of Police Affairs, Mohamed Ngari, has inaugurated the 16-member Governing Board of Police Academy, POLSC, after President Mohamed Bouari's approval. The appointees, comprising stakeholders from the security agency and the academia, were inaugurated at the Ministry of Police Affairs headquarters in Abuja. Ngari reaffirms the President's commitment to the quite a reformed professionalized and motivated force with a view to institutionalizing proactive policing. The minister said POLAC encourages the advancement of learning and to avail officers the opportunity to acquire higher and liberal education without discrimination of sex, political, religious or ethnic affiliation. Away from that, South-South Solidarity Group has claimed that among the entire geopolitical zones of the country, the region remains very marginalized. Coordinator of the group, Ipeng Ilefa, in an interview in Kalba, maintained that since the Second Republic of President Shaushagari, the zone which had led Joseph Wyers as Senate President has not occupied that position anymore. The group has now asked authorities to zone the Senate presidency to the South-South in the next dispensation in the interest of equity. We move to education where former students of Polytechnics across Nigeria have called on President Mohamed Bouari to sign the Higher National Diploma H&D and to Bachelor of Science BSc Dichotomy act to ensure the sustainability and growth of technological education. The former students under the urges of the Forum of Nigeria Polytechnics Alumni Association, FONPA, which lamented that the HND BSc dichotomy was doing great harm, said, giving assent to the act by the president will come freight nerves and renew hopes for millions of polytechnic graduates in the country. The FONPA chairman, Obialo, Ibebunku and Secretary Goge Ishola also called on the federal government to, as a matter of urgency and necessity, upgrade Nigerian polytechnics to degree awarding institutions for increased academic pros as it is the norm in advanced climbs, as well as to advance the frontiers of technological education. Meanwhile, the chief whip of the Senate and Senator representing Abia North, Oju Zokalu, has met with President Mohamed Bari at the presidential villa where he intimated him of his ambition to become Senate President in the 3rd Assembly. He however revealed that the President did not give him an automatic endorsement but exhibited a favorable disposition to his ambition to become the President of the Senate. Kalu also said he would not want to rock the boat if there is vested interest in the leadership of the Senate, but would not be averse to accepting the position if it is zoned to the South. Recall that Kalu had jolted 
Nigerians when he recently declared that it was his turn to become Senate President shortly after he got re-elected from his constituency. He said he was optimistic that when he elected to preside over the Senate, he would promote peace among its ranks and file. Away from that, the Bielsa government says it has commenced the rehabilitation of all the roads ravaged by flood in 2022. The Commissioner for Works and Infrastructure, Moses Taibowi, and his information orientation and strategy counterpart, Ayiba Duba, said this on Friday when they took journalists on an inspection of the roads. According to him, all the rehabilitation works would be completed before the rains fully set in by July. And back here, a Kwabam State Governor Domi Manuel within the week received the Governor elect Pastor Moino and the Deputy Governor elect Dr. Akone Yanyi, who went to present to him the certificate of return CRR they received from the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, following their victory in the gubernatorial elections. Speaking shortly after receiving his certificate of return, Pastor Moino, who described his victory at the polls as God's grace upon his life, assured Aquaban people of creating jobs for the youths and supporting entrepreneurs to further grow a robust economy in the state. The governor-elect pointed out that having been given the mandate to lead a Kaibam people in the next political dispensation, his vision for the state as encapsulated in the RISE agenda will drive development in the rural areas by giving reference to agricultural development, infrastructural development, security and education. Recall that Heineck had on 29, 30th and 31st EC the certificates of return to the governor-elect and Deputy Governor-elect and all the members-elect in the State House of Assembly around noon at the Commission's headquarters in the state at Udo Doma Avenue following the conclusion of the March 18 elections. And still to come in the news, Federal Government says local content in advertising will save 500,000 jobs. Please stay with us.
Many thanks for staying with us, and now to the rest of the news stories. Move now to Africa, where the South Sudan's Vice President Rig Masha, who is also leader of the opposition SPLM Tain Party, has rejected the appointment of General Cho Tong Balok as the new Defense Minister. The general is from the President Silva Kies Party and replaces Angelina Tenney. Marquez's wife, who was sacked a few weeks ago. A peace deal that ended a brutal five year civil war splits cabinet posts between Kiaz and Machia's parties. Meanwhile, the SPLM 10 has urged Kia to revoke General Thun's appointment, saying the president should not take such unilateral decisions until the row over the sacking is resolved with his deputy. The development strengthened the fragile agreement signed in 2018 that is intended to pave the way for elections next year. Meanwhile, Ugandan troops have taken up peacekeeping duties in the east of the Democratic Republic of Congo as part of the East African Community Regional Force. They will be expected to protect civilians in the areas of Banangana, Kiwanja, and Nembenga in Mrutshuru territory. The troops are also taxed with overseeing the withdrawal of the M23 rebels from an area they have occupied since last June. Meanwhile, the 2000 strong force will also oversee the reopening of trade routes between the border town of Bonangana and the regional capital, Goma. Elsewhere, at least 10 gold miners have been killed in an accident in northern Sudan and more than 20 others injured. Local media have blamed the collapse of the gold mine on the use of heavy machinery. Accidents are not uncommon in Sudan on the regulated mining industry. For say six months ago, 11 people died in a similar incident in the same part of North Sudan, while all the fatalities have been reported in the western Darfur region and Kodafan in the south. Meanwhile, over 2 million people are believed to be working in artisanal mining in Sudan. In the meantime, six women and five men from Ethiopia are known to have died in a road accident in Somalia. According to reports, they were being transported they were being transported by smugglers who reportedly planned to take them to Yemen via the port city of Basaso. But the lorry carrying them overturned a short distance from Basaso. Meanwhile, investigations into how it happened are still underway, but at this stage, local authorities say they believe the lorry had a mechanical issue and that no other vehicle was involved. Still in Africa, Kenya's President William Ruto has condemned Monday's opposition protests that turned violent and led to the damage of property, including the invasion of a farm belonging to former President Uhuru Kenyatta's family. Addressing Kenyans world. living in Berlin, President Ruto said he would not allow impunity to be part of the country's disgust. He vowed to ensure security for all Kenyans and businesses by giving the police the independence of enforcing law and order in the country. According to reports, a church and marks in Nairobi were destroyed by unknown assailants on Monday night after protesters engaged police in running battles. Meanwhile, religious leaders have condemned Monday's attack, urging politicians to consider dialogue and preach peace. Hands are all over this violence. When Azimio Laumoja called for protest in line with Article 37 of our Constitution, we never envisaged that in desperation the state would respond by hiring goons and mercenaries to rain terror on peaceful and innocent Kenyans. How does Ruto go to Germany? and talk about attracting German foreign investment to Kenya, knowing very well that back at home, 
he has put in place a machinery for victims for vicious attack on local investments. Ruto's hands are all over this violence. The Union has appealed for calm and called for dialogue following opposition protests in Kenya that have turned violent and left three people dead since last week. Opposition leader Raleigh Odinga called for demonstrations to protest against the high cost of living and what he calls electoral justice after last year's election. In a statement, AU Chairperson Musa Faki Muhammad urge stakeholders to exercise calm and engage in dialogue to address any differences. He said the conduct of election last year was successful and the outcome confirmed by the Supreme Court. Meanwhile, Kenyan religious leaders have also called for unconditional talks between President William Ruto and Odinga. On the foreign scene, Belarusian President Alexandra Lukashenko has called for a freezing of hostilities in Ukraine and warned that Russia would have to use the full force of its military if the West attempt to use a hypothetical pause in the war to encroach on its territory. Lukashenko said in an address that it is necessary to stop hostilities and declare truce that prohibits both sides from moving groups of troops and from transferring weapons, ammunition, manpower, and equipment. He wanted Moscow would be obliged to use the full power of its military industrial complex and the army to prevent the escalation of the conflict, as well as for as far as ammunition, non depleted uranium, and enriched uranium will be put into action if there is any notice of deception and suspicious movement across the border of Ukraine. Meanwhile, former U.S. President Donald Trump has been indicted by a Manhattan grand jury after a probe into hush money paid to sports star Stormy Daniels, becoming the first former U.S. president to face criminal charges even as he makes another run for the White House. The charges arising from an investigation led by Democratic Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Braggs could reshape the 2024 presidential race. Trump previously said he would continue campaigning for the Republican Party's nomination if charged with a crime. Meanwhile, the specific charges are not yet known and the indictment will likely be announced in the coming days. Trump will have to travel to Manhattan for fingerprinting and other processing at that point. In the meantime, President Vladimir Zelensky has vowed to defeat Russia, speaking alongside European leaders in Bacha, one year after Moscow's troops withdrew from the Ukrainian town, synonymous with war crimes allegations. Belarus strongman leader Alexandra Lukashenko, who is a close ally of the Kremlin, meanwhile urged Moscow and Kiev to broker a truce in Ukraine and start negotiations. In Geneva, UN rights chief Volker Tork warned Russia's war in Ukraine had made severe rights violations shockingly routine and was distracting humanity from battling existential threats to its survival. Recall that Russia forces pulled back from Bocha, a community town not west of Kiev, on March 31, 2022, just about a month after President Vladimir Putin ordered his troops to invade Ukraine leaving deaths and destruction in their wake. Well, development from the foreign scene where France's head left CGT Union has elected its first woman leader, Sophia Binet. Binet, 41, was elected Secretary General as a surprise compromise candidate after a long night of deliberations. Coming ahead of Maria Beauchamp, who was backed out by outgoing leader Felipe Martinez and Celine Vanzelletti, who was supported by a more headline faction of the union. The CGT press service said it could not confirm Binet's election as long as its members had not been informed. Binet, a former school supervisor, is the head of CGT's 
UGICT division representing engineers, managers and technical staff and was responsible for equality issues in the union's executive committee. On the foreign scene, Romanian police have arrested the leader of an American white supremacist group wanted in the United States in connection with rioting. According to the police, a 33-year-old was arrested, local media reports, and named him as Robert Rondo, who co-founded and led the Rise Above movement. Rando, together with several others of the California-based group, has been accused of inciting riots at far-right political rallies, including the deadly march in Chalosville, Virginia, in 2017. Meanwhile, Brazilian President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, who last week had to cancel a visit to China after coming down with pneumonia, has rescheduled the trip to April 11 through 14. The veteran leftist has sought closure and closer ties with China, Brazil's biggest trading partner, since taking office in January. He cancelled his original trip last Saturday, the day he was initially due to leave after being diagnosed with what his office called mal pneumonia. Now back at work, the 77-year-old met it clear the visit was a top priority after years of strained ties with Beijing on their far-right predecessor, Jair Bolsonaro, 2019-2022. through 2022. Away from that, six bodies were within the week recovered from a marsh in Quebec near the Canada-US border. According to Aquasin Mohawk Police Service, the bodies were located during an air search with assistance from the Canadian Coast Guard. Meanwhile, authorities are waiting an autopsy as well as toxicology test result to determine the cause of death. They also requested air support from Quebec and Ontario Provincial Police. And elsewhere, Finland will become the 31st member of NATO after Turkey's parliament voted to approve its application. Turkey had delayed Finland's bid to join the West's defensive alliance for months, complaining the Nordic nation was supporting terrorists. Reports say Sweden, which applied to join NATO at the same time last May, is still being blocked by Ankara over similar complaints. Meanwhile, Finland will now be formally admitted into NATO at its next summit, taking place in July in Lithuania. The vote by the Turkish Grand National Assembly to ratify Finland's membership in NATO. All 13 NATO allies have now ratified the accession protocol. And I have just spoken with President Sauli Ninistu to congratulate him on this historic occasion. Finland will formally join our alliance in the coming days. All allies agree that the rapid conclusion of the ratification process for Sweden will be in everyone's interest. I look forward to also welcoming Sweden as a full member of the NATO family as soon as possible. I welcome the vote by the Turkish Grand National Assembly to ratify Finland's membership in NATO. All 13 NATO allies have now ratified the accession protocol. And I have just spoken with President Sauli Ninistu to congratulate. On a business news, the Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, has said that the country's advertising industry will save around 500,000 jobs by codifying a 70% mandate for local content. Mohammed, who stated these are the 2023 Advertising Industry Colloquium, organized by the Advertising Regulatory Council of Niger in Lagos, also said the move would save the country hundreds of millions in capital flight. Representing the Minister, the Director of Communications at the Ministry of Information and Culture, Sunday Baba, said the colloquium 
would motivate industry players, especially young people, who would reuse what they had learned in school and will also learn about the industry's best practices to add value. He added that advertising had come a long way in advancing the economy and its role cannot be ignored by any developing country. Away from that, the Minister of Aviation, Hardy Sirika, has agreed to lead a delegation saddled with the responsibility of improving bilateral trade and collaboration between Nigeria and Pakistan. Sirika accepted the offer when a team from the Africa Center for Asia Studies, International Institute for Peace Leaders, UN Geneva, Ajakuta Chamber of Commerce, Industry, Mines and Agriculture, and all the partners paid a courtesy visit to the ministry in Abuja. Sirika, who spoke through the head press and public affairs of the ministry, Odut Tayo Olusei, disclosed that improving bilateral trade and collaboration between the two countries would bring about enormous benefits to both countries. In the meantime, World Bank has said developing countries, including Nigeria, have huge investment needs due to their inadequate infrastructure and all the challenges. The Washington-based lender called on policymakers to create an environment conducive for investment and devoid of corruption. The World Bank Group President David Malpa said these on Thursday in Nime, Niger Republic, as he delivered a speech titled Growth and Stability During Crisis at the Abdul Mamani University of Nime. Malpa has noted that capital inflows from abroad will have a role to play in financing these needs stressing that the widespread pressures from debt distress countries will not be short of foreign finance. Away from that, the manager of Nigeria's Sovereign Wealth Fund, the Nigeria's Sovereign Investment Authority, NSIA, has said NSIA grew its net assets by 10% from 919.73 billion naira in 2021 to 1.02 trillion in 2022 financial year. This is disclosed in its audited result for the 2022 fiscal year, which was released on Thursday. The highlights of NSIA's activities and performance during the period under the review also show that it recorded its 10th year of continuous positive earnings in spite of volatility across markets. The Managing Director and Chief Executive Officer Aminu Umar Sadiq said the performance was recorded despite the challenges in the operating environment. And still to come in the news. Nigeria win third game against Ghana in cricket. So stay with us. Many thanks for staying with us. Now to the rest of the news stories. In health, Bacchus State Primary Health Care Development Agency has reportedly recorded 22 deaths from loss of fever cases across the state in 2023. The chairman of the agency, Relwanu Mohammed, met this known at a one-day advocacy engagement meeting with traditional and religious leaders and prevention of infectious diseases in Bacchus State. Mohammed, who was represented by the Deputy Director of Disease Control and Immunization of the agency, Haruna Wakil, said Boucher State also recorded 678 suspected loss of fever cases, 95 confirmed cases, and 22 thirds. The agency stressed the need for proactive measures in the fight against infectious diseases, adding that traditional rulers and community leaders have significant roles to play in achieving the set objectives.
still in hell, the governor of Washington State, a Demola Deleke, and consul general of the United States, consulate in Lagos, Will Stevens, has called for the collaboration of all stakeholders to enable more people in the state know their human immunodeficiency virus status. Reports say they both spoke in Oshaba at the launching of the Ocean Arts Search Project, an initiative of Excellence Community Education and Welfare Scheme aimed at delivering comprehensive and sustainable HIV and AIDS clinical and community services to achieve HIV epidemic control in sub-national units of Delta, Ekiti and Ocean states. The initiative is funded by the United States President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief through the Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Adeleke, who was represented at the event by his deputy, Kola Adewusi, disclosed that in the first five months of active surge implementation, Ocean had seen a leap in treatment coverage of 12%. In sports, Nigeria have won their third game against China by 62 runs at the ongoing Nigeria Cricket Federation Women's Invitational in Lagos. The game, which was held at the Tafewa Balewa Square Cricket Oval on Friday, saw the Nigeria team on a slow start to the game, but usual suspects Salome Sande and Agatha Obulo helped to keep helped to keep the Nigerian side ahead of the game. After the game, Reda Ofori, captain of the Ghanaian side, said there were lots of lessons garnered so far from the tournament. Meanwhile, Italy's Janik Sina turned on style to earn Carlos Alcaraz's hopes of the sunshine double and his reign as well, number one, triumphing 6 7, 6 4, 6 2 in the Miami Open semifinals on Friday. Tina will meet Russian Daniel Medvedev in Sunday's final, while Alcaraz will lose his number one ranking to Novak Djokovic. Reports say the disappointment for the 19 year old Alcaraz, the defending champion in Miami, and coming off a title at Indian Wells will be tinged with frustration after he struggled in the third set with leg cramps. It had been an entrailing and entertaining par heating performance from both men in the first set with an incredible 25 shot exchange in the seventh game, bringing the crowd to their feet. Still in sports, Petra Vitova powered into the final of the WTA Miami Open on Friday with a straight sets victory over Romania's Serona Xiste. Zets veteran Vitova advanced to a Saturday showdown against Wembledon champion Elena Rybakina with a 7-5, 6-4 win in 1 hour 41 minutes. In a battle of two of the WTA's more experienced layers, Sisti, playing in a first WTF semi-final in a decade, was fastest out of the blocks, taking a 5-2 lead in the first set. But the Romanian, who is enjoying a revival in form, having also reached the last eight at Indian Wells, failed to convert on either of the two set points she had on serve at 5-4, with Vitova breaking twice to take the set. On our entertainment news, our African Paralympic champion Oscar Pistorius was refused parole after seeking early release from prison a decade after he shot and killed his girlfriend. The Department of Correctional Services said a parole board found Pistorius had not completed the minimum detention period required to be let out. Pistorius killed Riva Stenkamp a model in the early hours of Valentine's Day in 2013, firing four times through the bathroom door of his ultra-secure Pretoria house in a killing that shocked the world. Meanwhile, a parole hearing opened within the week at the jail on the outskirts of the capital where the 36-year-old is detained. 
Thincam's parents who opposed an early release said they do not believe the ex outlet told the truth about what happened and has not shown remorse. Welcome to the decision. Dilan Entertainment, the Lagos State Police Command has begun an investigation into the death of Kambili Chiku, the son of popular actor Yul Edoche. It was gathered that Edoche had reported the death of his son to the police and in the state. The state's police public relations officer, SP Benjamin Hondoyan, who spoke with newsmen, confirmed the development, saying the matter would be forwarded to the State Criminal Investigation Department. Kambili Cheku, 16, died on Thursday morning after developing a seizure and was rushed to the mother and child hospital in Lagos. In the meantime, the Ogun State Police Command has arrested famous singer Habib Okikiola, commonly called Portable, who had earlier refused to honor the police invitation. Recall that earlier on Tuesday, Two videos of the musician raining curses and rough handling some men of the Nigerian police surfaced on the internet. And while the police had condemned the singer's actions and also threatened to prosecute him. And that's all we have for you at this time to ensure to follow us on social media and subscribe to our YouTube channel, all of which you can find on our website, spectrumtv.ng. You've been watching Spectrum TV recap news story, a recap of major stories within the week. I am Francis Edit. Enjoy the rest of your time.